Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Best Picture Must Be Doing Something Right podcast. I'm here with Jamie. Hello. And we're back with another episode uh, coming at you. Not sure, not too uh, not too long after the last one, which is, which is good. We're getting out, yeah. getting them out thick and fast. Um, before we start, just want to plug the places where you can find us. Uh, make sure to follow on Spotify get both versions of the show on there it's the only place where you can get both versions um follow it on youtube i'm working hard on the youtube channel at the moment we're getting all the thumbnails and stuff sorted with the new logo and everything so oh, that's really um, exciting yeah yeah uh, i'm happy with how that's going um not not too happy about the way that it looks at the moment um in terms of the videos i'd ideally want sort of logo in the background but as it's just audio i think you can understand uh the situation we're in right now and also follow on Twitter. This is an important one because if you want to get involved in the show, send any questions or if you're interested in even appearing on the show, um, you can let me know on their best picture underscore pod on Twitter. Um, DMs are always open on there as well. Um, OK, let's get started. Um, today's film is uh, has to be started, has to be stated with an asterisk. I've got to come clean. I have not been able to rewatch this film before the show, but Jamie has, I believe. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I rewatched it very recently. I think it should be an easy one to talk about anyway. Yeah, th- there's the thing. It's one of those films that because I'm such a big fan, I'm sort of like, I- I- I'm fine talking about it anyway. And that film is Chris Vanilla's Dunkirk, written and directed, of course, by Chris Vanilla. Is it Sir Chris Vanilla now? I'm sure it must be. Is it? Um, I believe so. I don't know. I missed that. Yeah. Uh, he should he should be anyway. He's a he's a national treasure. <laughs> is uh, you checking? You checking? Uh... I, I'm checking right now. I, I, C- I'm interested. CBE. CBE. Close enough. Yeah, close yeah. enough. Once he wins his Oscar, he'll, he'll get that knighthood surely. Um, <laughs> and the film stars uh, Fian Whitehead, uh, Barry Keown, Mark Rylance, Tom Hardy and Jack Loudon, amongst others. It's a very big ensemble cast. Yeah, it's one of a lot that you don't really re- films. Yeah, it's one of the lot where it's sort of like, sometimes you don't recognise people. Oh, Kenneth Branagh was the other one I was trying to think of. I was looking down the... Basically, to give some context to this, on IMDb, they list them based on when they first appear in the film, so you don't see uh, which the main stars in it. Which is difficult, because just to set the atmosphere for the film, we start off with just some... We like follow from the ground up a bunch of soldiers yeah. on what they're doing, which means there's a lot of people that just aren't relevant later in the film. Yeah, <laughs> so it's uh, hard to tell. <laughs> uh, basic uh, description of the plot: Allied soldiers from Belgium, the British Commonwealth and Empire, and France are surrounded by the German army and evacuated during a fierce battle in World War Two. This is one of the most major World War Two films i think of all time really it's been you know the the idea of 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 dunkirk and it, it being such a important part of world war Two um or just british history in general really um it's never really been properly tackled on film before this point um obviously there was a film in the 1950s i believe but i feel like um this is a this is an important film and it's important that Christopher Nolan made it. What were your general impressions of how he did in portraying these events? I think it did a perfect job at setting the atmosphere because uh, just for a bit of, I'm not history buff, uh, although I mm. do I do look at some videos on YouTube, you know, that catch my attention. Yeah. But a bit of context, this is before France fell. In fact, this is one of the key events that led up to France falling. And it's the first mm. major loss for the Allies in the sense that they had to basically retreat from Europe. Yeah. And it really captures this idea. There's some optimism to the film, but it it really captures the idea that this is, this is the allied forces backed into a corner. What's fascinating is Nolan has gone on record. I mean, you can see the heavy influences from saving private Ryan in the film, but he's gone on record saying he didn't want to copy the same sort of suspense from saving private Ryan. He described that as being more of a horror. Mm-hmm. He he said uh, it's a different. He was wanting a different kind of suspense, and I kind of understand what he means by that because whereas 
despite it being towards the end of the war, Saving Private Ryan is definitely much more of a suspenseful horror. There's dread to it. Nobody feels yep. safe. In in this film, it's about getting to safety, and every single step closer towards that is a bit is a bit more hopeful and it's a bit more thrilling. It, it's more of a, it's it more, is definitely thrilling. Yeah. I describe it more of a roller coaster sort of suspense compared to the yeah. the, the, the existential like panic of, of something like Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, but, it's definitely a different approach to the World uh, World War Two film, isn't it? Yeah, ab- absolutely. But it's still got that same kind of brutality. Like he doesn't shy away from that. I mean, there, are, there are, we won't go into spoilers, of course, but there are. We've already laid in the show, but there are. Yeah, um, there are people. If you who, can, if you can remember, I, I can't really. Remember I, I can, I can, I can remember some. So that, that you'll have to carry that bit. I think. <laughs> some significant moment, sure, you want yeah. to talk about. But yeah, I mean, in terms of it's, it did a, apparently it did really well with historical accuracy. I've just got to that that bit now. There's a couple of changes it's, that's made just for. Uh, visual communication and making things a bit more clear to the audience, you know, so it stands as its own film. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I mean, it it, it captures the desperation of it. And I think that's something you really need to go for when you're when you're doing this kind of film. Yeah, um, I think what's important is the way that it's structured. I feel like this is, if I was ever to show anyone a film about how to edit a film, I think this would be a perfect example. I think Lee Smith does an incredible job with the edit because of, um, instead of sticking with the characters, which might be um, quite emotionally daunting at times and sort of like um, a bit, it can, it can tend to be a bit stressful, can't it? Yeah. If you're following the same... Um, characters all the time that disruption and it's it's the idea of of the three elements isn't it it's the sand the sea and in the air and where you get the intertwining narratives in that sense which is the thing that stuck with me the most i think that kind of visual style is so impressive oh definitely that it's a different approach to storytelling as well um you get different perspectives on the events and also the don't the the battle, uh, or you could call it a battle, would you? Um, um, yeah, I, I, say that. I guess so. Yeah, um, the battle comes from different parts of different people involved, isn't there? And there's, there's, there's the central character of the film, Whitehead's character, who we see straight away, uh, Tommy, um, and also you see the scenes in the air with uh, Tom Hardy in the helicopter, and also those scenes with uh, Mark Rylance. Um, uh, and Bar- Barakir and, and um, Killian Murphy uh, on the boat. That's, as well. uh, it's, it's, that's why I, I say it's a film about perspective. And of course, it's yeah. Christopher Nolan, so it plays around with the timeline a bit. And when we see yeah. things start to intersect, it, it's very satisfying. It's yeah. such a big payoff. But I'll also say there is, there's a moment where we we meet a character first in one timeline and then yep. we see him in the past in the week-long timeline because obviously they haven't caught up yet. Mm-hmm. And, well, basically, it all takes place over the same week, then the same day, then the same hour. Yeah, Because quite realistically, the British Air Force could only afford an hour of fuel over over the sea up to actually fight off the German advance. So that's why yeah. the, it's contained like that. So not only is it a great storytelling tool, it's also again keeps it grounded to what actually had to happen but yeah i mean the fact that we, oh we can't talk about it yet because it's spoilers yeah, yeah but yeah we see we see one character first and then how they were different in the past and it's yeah, yeah. it's very satisfying but also really sells the narrative of what's going on and how in such a short amount of time people can change and yeah. there's so many great we talk about suspense what? there's so many great sequences in this film well, it's also about how war changes you doesn't it and yeah. changes the sort of situations you're in like like there's that there's one of the the famous scenes that i think was one of the standout ones in the trailer um where they had where where they finally get where all the soldiers are finally getting food and stuff and uh having sandwiches and everything and then the next thing you know they're all on the water oh, yeah. and bomb down there's that there's that shot of harry styles in the trailer isn't there of him uh of him struggling for air and stuff um, those kind of scenes i think are so impressive uh in terms of the way that things can shift you're never ever safe in those kind of scenarios as soon as you think you're okay it's it's sort of another thing you can just be that everything just can be over in an instant and i feel like that is like that's the 
most important emotion to get across, and that's the message that you have here, sort of like what? interpretation of the way that that life and death can be minim- absolutely minimal at any second. What do you think of uh, Harry Styles' performance? Uh, I think he's good in the film, to be fair. I don't think it was a performance that made me feel like, oh, this guy is an incredible actor. But then again, it's not one where it's sort of like he's sick, sticking out like a sore thumb. He's sort of, he, yeah, he, gets he the fits job that done. kind of aesthetic, doesn't I it? think it um, sells the idea of the tragedy of it a bit because no one's cast such a big name to play such yeah. an ordinary guy who's caught up in just the tragedy that's sort of, of the, war. That's sort of the point, yeah, isn't exactly. it? It's for people from different backgrounds. It's from from all over, all stuck in this sort of situation where they're, they're literally just giving up their lives for their country. Trying to survive, yeah, scrambling. It really sells it. I think that was some really clever Because casting. it's all meaning. Yeah, it's all meaningless at this point. It doesn't matter where you come from, who your family is, how much money you've got or anything. Uh, it's, it's just about battling to survive and, and being there for for your fellow soldiers and it shows you know our, our main characters are quite quite wily and quite clever and we see the different ways they they like scramble i'll talk about one bit yeah. because it's right at the start yeah. when uh um, i think i know what you mean when gibson and uh tommy that's fiona, tommy. that's fiona whitehead's character when they yeah. pick up a soldier to get ahead to the first ship that's leaving yeah well it's not that's the thing. it's not the first ship that's leaving but it's the first chance they've got Oh, that that is so intense. I feel like I, th- I think that's one of the that's definitely there's a there's definitely a trailer that's um, made based on just that scene, isn't there? One of the first ones that came out of saving the um, of taking the injured soldier. Yeah, and it's just this incredible segment played together. I was like, Hans Zimmer score for that sequence was incredible because you literally feel every second. Yeah. Because of how intense that score was, and sort of like, if you watch this film with uh, Dolby Atmos sound, it's going to be incredibly intense, and you're sort of like, <laughs> you know, you're on the edge of your seat straight away, and that sort of like gears you up to what you're actually in for. Because because the film starts really slowly. You obviously have that scene where with Tommy walking through the ta- empty town centre with sort of the the leaflets flying around and stuff like that. And then you're thrown straight into this situation where next thing you know he's there on the there on the ground getting bombed on the beach and having to take this injured soldier and it's like milliseconds between whether they're going to make it or not. It's yeah. It's those um, those propaganda flyers are a real thing as well. The the yeah. British did it as well, which is interesting. I think even before 1939, they dropped some mm. over over Germany. I think that's. <laughs> I don't know, just just yeah. that just that the way information is used in war is fascinating. But but th- this isn't a spy film or all like that. But I just wanted to point out no. that attention to detail and how it it could affect the uh, the soldiers and just the, the, just the yeah. little different tactics that both sides use during the war. I mean, yeah. it's something that I really appreciate when that detail is given in these kind of films. It sells its period, yeah. doesn't it? That it's trying to portray, and that's partly to do with I think the way that the film is shot as well the 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 cinematography is unbelievable um especially the color palettes in terms of the the the, the blue and green color palette although take, which was just oh, consistent for apparently the they they wouldn't have been color the leaflets that were dropped because and that makes sense because that, that would have been needlessly expensive so yeah historical inaccuracy there apparently Oh, wow. ruin the film. They ruin it. <laughs> exactly. It's sort of like two seconds in, I turn it on. It's a <laughs> color on it. Oh, turn but it that's on. another thing. That's another change which is just used to sell it to the audience. Like it's it's something the audience can understand and it visually just sells what's going on. So I think that's fine. That's obviously not. <laughs> I don't think anyone would argue that's that's a problem in terms of historical yeah. accuracy. Uh, what do you think about uh, Kenneth Branagh, who was playing it? He was playing a composite character with a few um, different commanders. He obviously, he obviously gets the famous line, which has been mean to death, hasn't it? The, um, there it is, home um, uh, on the horizon. I, I think he's he's good as he always is. I think um, he's such yeah, he's such a sort of calming presence. I think sometimes having someone like him on board, but I feel like the cast in general were 
pretty impressive. There's no sort of standout performances. I think he's just a good ensemble. Yeah, um, he's, you don't need to be over he's the very top. Gra- I was going to say, yeah, it's thing. very grounded characters. I mean, let's have a look. How did it, is it time to talk about awards? Um, well, you can do, yeah. Um, I thought Fionn Whitehead was really impressive. I, I, I don't know why he wasn't in like a... I don't think he was in Rising Star that year. He really should have been. Yeah, he's, he's the only one that was, I think, is a... What would you say, like a loud enough... No, that sounds bad. A big enough... Well, role. he's the lead yeah. anyway. I, I, I consider that a lead role. Absolutely. Um, but like, like, like you said, most people... But his, his performance is really, really impressive. Yeah. Um, as someone that I hadn't seen on screen before, I don't think. Especially not in a role like this. Um... I feel like that was very impressive. Mark Rylance was the one that was sort of like touted as potential um, supporting actor nomination, uh, getting a supporting actor nomination because it was what they called the afterglow, where because it was a couple of years Bridge after of he won for yeah. Bridge of Spies, it's sort of like oh he's he's in the Academy of Books now, but um, I don't think he does enough really um, to stand out above above the crowd really. Though it is a uh, he's always he's always great. Mark Rylance he's a, he's a safe pair of hands. Yeah. Um, all the time, and again, another calming presence uh, uh, alongside um, Kelly Murphy and uh, Barry Kieran, who are uh, fantastic actors in their own right as well. Of course, yeah, like long term collaborators of Nolan pop up, including Michael Caine having a voice cameo. Yeah, yeah, I heard about it. He's the one who talks to yeah, Tom Hardy some... at the start of the film. Yeah, it's not instantly recognisable, but yeah. Um, yeah, let's talk about it's, it's awards performance and we'll talk more about the plot once we get into yeah. the spoilers section, I think. I think that's all we can really talk about so far. Um, it did very well at the Academy Awards, nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Cinematography, Best Original Score and Best Production Design and won in three categories for Film Editing, Sound Editing and all Sound technical. Mixing. This was, yeah, yeah, but then again, it's completely yeah, absolutely. Deserved, isn't it? I think it could have gotten in, uh, into screenplay in a different year, but original screenplay that year, I think, is the, was the strongest that I've ever seen it. So, I, I genuinely think that that lineup that year is, is an all timer. Obviously, Get Out won for Jordan Peele and um, the Big Sick Lady and, Bird, and it was on the Shape of Water, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. That's an incredible. Yeah. What happened that year was all the big films <clears throat> were original screenplays. There was hardly any in adapted. Where you just had Call Me by Your Name, and that was the only film nominated. For best oh picture. yeah, the <laughs> there was eligible in adapted, adapted is a little bit weak. I mean, they are good, but it's like the Disaster Artist, Logan, and, and they are deserved to be nominated. But in any yep. other year, they wouldn't have got in. They wouldn't be close because they weren't they weren't nominated for anything else. I don't think. Um, like Mudbound got into supporting actors as well, but that was it. Um, and then Logan and. Disaster losses were low. Again, not to throw them films under the bus. They are good screenplays, but the the original definitely stands above the adapted. Yeah. Um, what I was going to ask is because obviously this is um, Christopher Nolan's real breakthrough for the Academy, really. I mean, his films have received wins before. Obviously, Heath Ledger for uh, The Dark Knight, one, two, one supporting actor in 2008, Interstellar won visual effects. Inception was nominated for Best Picture, but this is the first time um, he's received an individual nomination. Is um, is, um, in director, anyway, he'd previously been nominated in screenplay for Memento, um, which was obviously his main breakthrough in general. I guess like... um, in the early two thousands. Why? Why does this film stand out as a as a top level, as like a top five director performance of? Um, directing achievement of that year while a film like in, uh, Inception or Interstellar I guess wasn't. previously the Academy just saw him as a, um, as a as a high quality popcorn filmmaker almost like I mean I think some of his previous direction has been brilliant but I don't I think the Academy deliberately overlooked him in, in anything that wasn't technical because his, his films are very technically yeah. impressive I think what this film did with the characters and the tone and the atmosphere and the suspense proved to the Academy what uh, mainstream audiences have been seeing for years in Nolan's talent. Yeah. Because it doesn't feel like a career nod. I don't. Th- this isn't a career nod at all. This no. is for Dunkirk. But I do feel like this is a, a um, uh, what's it called? It's sort of like with uh, you can say the same for like Scorsese with The Irishman and a uh, Passion yeah. Project, that's it. Um, 
where you feel like you get to that stage where you can make any film that you want. And you feel like with this film, this was a film that, that Nolan would have wanted to make more than At anything else. At the same else. time, it does feel and like it's got that Academy appeal. Although, well, although you are absolutely yeah. correct, because I think he's had this idea since the 90s. I read, yeah. I read somewhere. <laughs> so, yeah, this this is definitely a passion project. About getting to the stage where you can actually make a good... Uh, get the necessary budget, but also be known that you're going to get that money back. In terms of Nolan just making whatever he wants, uh, that definitely comes through a lot more with Tenet and not really yes. caring if anyone gets it or... Uh, well, he does care, but I mean in the sense that he doesn't have to. Like Tenet is definitely him just making... He has this idea. He thinks it would look good, so he made it and put hundreds of millions into yeah. it. Yeah. But with and that's why he was so insistent about it being yeah, exactly. famous as well. And to be fair, it, it, considering the circumstances, it actually didn't do too so badly in, in, in terms of box office. I think it got a very similar box office return to Interstellar, actually. Um, though, uh, though that is a really incredible achievement, considering that <laughs> barely anyone went to cinema it, last year. It would have done. Um, I, I wasn't a massive fan of Tenet, partly because of it not having Hans Zimmer as the composer. I feel like what I would be concerned about with with um, Nolan going forward is this idea of if he keeps on losing his collab- close collaborators. Like he's been, he's been had good replacements. So when he lost uh, Wally Fister as a cinematographer, he had for this film Hoyt van Hoytema, who is an incredible cinematographer in his own right, anyway. Um, which which made it just fine and unnoticeable, but but with replacing Hans Zimmer with um, Goranson, I can't remember his Ludwig. Thing. Um, yeah, Ludwig uh, Goranson. It was it was you know it was night and day the difference. And here's the thing the of what we, they brought to the film. We won't be talking about Tenet on this show because it, it was not nominated. No, it got a couple. I think it will. Yeah, it will win. Best production effects, design and visual effects of... is what it's nominated for. It won't win production design. <laughs> this this will wage badly. <laughs> I think it will win. It will win. It will win. It will win visual production design. Oh, oh yeah, fair, oh, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah, but for like visual effects, I think he got lucky in terms of the year. Yeah, didn't it? Um, uh, the editor here was Lee Smith, who recently edited um 1917. Which is a very different edited film, though I think equally as impressive because obviously 1917 looks like it was done in one shot, stitch editing. While with this film, it's very obvious. I feel like, yeah, Lee Smith is going to uh, make a really good name for, uh, already has made a good name for himself as like a solid yeah. hand for these like big epic films. And the fact they can go from a, a Dunkirk to a 1917, these two completely different styles of editing. I mean, like, what yeah. more could you ask for in terms of like setting yourself up? Yeah, but um, well, I think I think one last thing that we'll, we'll talk about in terms of the awards context. Do you, do you feel like? So I feel like the genre here, uh, as a war film, made it a strong contender as a nominee all the time because when it was first released, it was actually the favorite to win Best Picture, um, because obviously no one it, it proved itself to be a great film, while the other films. Hadn't got to that stage yet, but by the end of the by the end of the season, it was more a case of uh, being between um, three bill, three billboards outside of Missouri and uh, Shape of Water, and potentially Get Out as well. Um, do you feel like there's this idea that you can't really give, and especially with the context of 1917 losing last year to Parasite, this idea that war films aren't going to be winning? Best picture again anytime soon. Do you feel like it's like a been there, done that for them? Obviously, there's been several that have won in the past. Um, do you feel like this sort of like a been there, done that for? Just to uh, just to quickly um, expand on what I said, because it wouldn't be fair to not give Lee Smith his due. He's been in the business for decades, so I just thought yeah. I'd point that out because it made it. I, yeah. The way I said, as I was thinking it back, I made it sound like he's been working for three years. <laughs> you know, Lee Smith is a very yeah, yeah, accomplished. Exactly, yeah. uh, I just decided to go on his, his uh, Wikipedia and double check. So he's done all of Nolan's, or most of it. He's done The Truman Show. Uh, oh, I love Truman what do you Show. like? Wait, do you like The Truman Show? Love that film. 
Yeah, I thought so. I thought you yeah. said you didn't like it. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> no, I love it. I uh, love Master it. and Commander, Dead Poet Society. Oh, I did additional film editing on that. So, yeah, I just like to clear up. And yeah. then you... No, but it, but it's about making them yourself. A, yeah, exactly. A I'm so impressed with that back to back of Dunkirk and then 1917. And you, and what do you say? Yeah. Do you think war films are done now? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, in terms <laughs> of actually winning um, that picture film. That is not an easy question because we. No, obviously it's a year by we, year. We thing, talk about, it? but I, is it is it is it Oscar bit to do a war film because? It's difficult. The it? era of traditional Oscar bit is sort of faded out because of people's awareness in like cultural osmosis. Like people, people just know yeah. what to look for. But with war films, they're just gonna get grander and grander, especially after 1917. They're just gonna get bigger yeah. and more epic. It's like at, at a certain point, it's gonna cross the line into being Oscar worthy, into going back yeah. to being like a, a genre of like mass entertainment. Uh, well, they've sort of separated into two things, haven't they? Where you've either got the big action film, like uh, this one with uh, Dunkirk, you have films like Hacksaw Ridge, there's a point of example, Hurt Locker, um, obviously looking at different wars, uh, American Sniper to a certain extent as well, though I feel like that that's a real contrast between the two. Uh, 1917 will be a prime example as well. While you also have your, your war Dark dramas, Star Wars, like yeah. Dark Tower and The Imitation Game and, and films like that. So, um, so like all of them have been proven to be films that have been looked at fondly by the Academy. But I think unless something incredibly special comes out, and I thought 1917 was going to be that film, um, I don't think it will get I, to I think we're going to see less of the uh, Darkest Hours is uh, is what I'm trying to say. I hope so. <laughs> that film <laughs> sucks. And it hasn't aged well either, which is weird to say for a sort of war it film. Just, but, it's, um, it's a very old-fashioned film. <laughs> Yeah, before before we move on to the spoiler section, I just want to get that one impression. So, like, there two films about Dunkirk coming out at the same time. I've had a lot of debates with people because I feel very strongly that this is the far superior film than uh, Dark Tower. What? Do, well, first of all, do you think this is a better film? Yeah. <clears throat> and second of all, which one I think portrays the idea of Dunkirk better? Well, yeah, of course, of course, Dunkirk does a better. Job. Seeing it at ground level is just so much more satisfying and so much more accurate. Uh, Darkest Hour, I, I I wasn't bored when I was watching it. Like I, I don't I don't dislike it as much as you do, yeah. but it's very safe. Like I don't really, yeah, I don't strongly dislike it. It's just like, would it's you agree that it's just a very safe take on it? And it's it's just like it's a vehicle for Gary Oldman's yeah. performance, which is great. Literally, but which was stupid in itself because if you watch the first season of The Crown you will see John Lithgow's performance as Winston Churchill being far superior. I mean, we'll, we'll talk, probably talk about Dark Star with a different show, like, <laughs> possibly at some point, but, but that, that film annoyed me because it's sort of like, he's it's, it's like, you know, he's in... The, um, Winston Churchill was an old man by that point, and he's there, it's like, skipping down the stairs and stuff, when he's, cause he's, just because he's wearing a <laughs> he's not like that. But, but yeah, I feel very strongly that this film portrays... Um, the ideas of everything around Dunkirk. You don't need to know all the background stuff. I just want to see like what actually happened. And this film does an incredible job at that. And it was one of my favorite films of that year. And I do recommend people checking it out um, uh, if they haven't done so. But if you have done so, then you will be interested to, see our, to hear our thoughts on the uh, things that happened later on in the film. So we're going to talk about um, everything that happened uh, that might spoil the film. So if you have not seen the film and you don't want to hear spoilers, then uh, I'd suggest turning off now. Thank you for listening. And let's get on to the spoiler section. Oh, mate. All right. It's just... On it's, to spoilers. It's the summary of tragedy in this Go film. Ahead. It's... Uh, it so, I mean, the the first thing that comes... To... <laughs> oh, no. It's such a bait and switch. It's, like, it's such a Nolan screwing over the audience so it, we have this on with mark rylance we have um this uh let me get his name right i think is it george we have his son peter and we yeah. have uh their their hand their like ship hand uh george i think i don't, I don't know what like, i think he just helps mm. them out 
Uh, and he, he yeah. insists on going with them, even though he's too young, just because he, he wants to help out. Like. Mm-hmm. When we find out later, he, he, you know, he wants to be in the papers, he wants to contribute and be known for doing something great. And yeah. then, of course, they run into uh, Killian, uh, Killian Murphy's character. Yeah, yeah, and I, the, I, I, the I classic did it twice. It's <laughs> Killian, right? It's Killian. Acting, it? I don't yeah. know. What, sorry, I, I shouldn't yeah, have yeah, corrected yeah. myself. But yeah, they're, they're running to Killian Murphy's character. And he's, he's shell-shocked yeah. and he's not quite himself. And we see him later on, in the uh, earlier on in the week, where he's much more in control and he's much more calm. And he's like, he's like a real leader. And yeah. seeing what happens to him, especially on a rewatch... Is just so miserable, and then of course they, mm. they get into a fight because yeah, um, yeah. he doesn't want to go back, understandably. And uh, and George, yeah, yeah, because <laughs> we've by this yeah, by this point we've yeah. seen what went on. We we get a completely different view of of the way that Mark Rylance's character. We can sympathise, okay. but yeah, Mark Rylance obviously he wants yeah. to get as many of uh, many of uh, the the boys back home as he can. And he's got a real honour to it, but yeah. so he's not going to turn the boat around and they get into a fight and George ends up getting knocked down the stairs. And it is real, it's such a classic bait and switch because you, you think he's been set up to do something yeah. heroic and he just goes out in the most meaningless and tragic way possible. Yeah. But it's sort of like, I feel like that kind of narrative is very important to understand yeah. the impact of death during wartime, that it isn't like... Do you see films like this where they have such a large um, death count? Um, just the sheer number of people just dying on screen. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, one bomb goes off and there's suddenly a shot of, like, 30-odd people all dead on the floor and stuff. To have to show the real-life impact of it. And it's something that yeah. 1917 does incredibly well as well by by taking one specific character and saying, this is the impact that the death of this character has on its family. Then that makes it way more. I need to rewatch to the audience. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that for for another show. Uh, so yeah, we we have a named character that we we can we understand and we can sympathise with, and they, they die in such a meaningless way. And the symbolism there is speaks for itself. And then we have uh, we have Gibson, who is probably yeah. one of the more heroic people in the film. He, he sacrifices his own safety to mm-hmm. save. Um, Tommy and Alex, is it? Um, Harry Styles' um, character. Not too sure. Alex. We'll call him Alex. Yeah, he might not be his name. So to save Tommy yeah. and Alex, <laughs> and then there's just unfortunately there's just no payoff for it. There's no reward for it at the end. He's trying to evacuate as well, but it is yeah. before. He's a French soldier, and he's trying to evacuate, but it's it's before yeah, yeah. Churchill officially gave the the order. I think for French soldiers to be evacuated as well. So a lot of people are very um hmm. look really harsh towards him and really you would even say like bigoted, they're saying, Oh, you're French, you need to go back and fight with your French soldiers, you're a deserter or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I mean he's I don't know how much the, this guy has to do to earn his uh, to earn his ticket back because he's saved their lives hmm. a couple of times by this point when when yeah. they get onto that um Shard, what would you say that boat like a civil was it a civilian boat? It was like a Dutch boat, right? Yeah, yeah it was it was like it was a Dutch oh, boat. So the, it we'll just say it is. <laughs> so by the time yeah, we get yeah. onto I, that I boat, he's he's already done more than enough, but and then it then he dies again, like trying to help because he, he he's the last one to yeah. to stop plugging up the holes. And it's it just it's, I think the symbolism there is very clear in that this this French soldier gave his life for our British soldiers to escape uh, because I think the was it like 40,000 casualties or something of, of French soldiers trying to yeah. hold back the German advance, oh, successfully holding back the German advance. Yeah, so there's real, there's real weight to it. I mean, I know I said at the beginning of the episode that it's deliberately not trying to have the horror and the dread of something like Saving Private Ryan. It does not shy away from yep. the, the tragedy of it. Definitely not. Um, I think we'll leave it there. Is there anything else you want to add? Is there anything you can remember off the top of your head you want to talk about? What what, what, what scene impacts impacts you? Um, 
to be honest, it's just more the ones at the start, and then then sort of the final scene as well, where you see sort of like the all the soldiers coming back. Oh yeah, and Harry Styles uh, is like, England. "Oh, they're going to spare things in the streets because of course they don't know. He thinks they're going to be tra- like cowards through a tree, yeah. but people are welcoming back with open yeah. arms, and that's that's a really great moment." Yeah, it's a, it's a good emotional payoff, though. Obviously, you're still thinking about, and and it's the same with the the soldiers. The, you just think yeah. about everyone that's been uh, including behind. Tom Hardy. <laughs> no, it's just got it's got that action shot yeah, on, exactly. the, on the beach. That, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that iconic shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, that is definitely a, a the, you need a. I think you need a shot like that to really like blow people away and make a film stick in your mind over time. I think that's going to be the that's going to be the thing that people remember, and and I feel like that's something that all oh, that films imagery. too is leave you with, yeah, of a certain imagery. Is because because of the like the with the real like orange flames, orange and yellow flames going up in the air with him standing where you can't really see him. It's yeah. just like a sort of like a shadow, sort of um, uh, just in the way. Um, because that is so different to the general aesthetic of the film, the the color palette and everything like that, it makes it way yeah, stand out way absolutely. more than it would normally. And you know, Nolan is just an incredible filmmaker, and I really hope he makes more films like this. Even though he's got a track record of doing such a great job on so many different types of films, I just I just hope he makes more films Do we like know what this. He's doing next? Can you know? Flex his muscles a bit. Um, I don't know. I can check that for you then. If it is um, up on IMDb anyway. I think it's quite, quite difficult for him to make oh, yeah, right, right. the films he wants to make. at this now, moment. It? Uh, and it's just come off a of tenet, so... Um, face on the screen. Oh, oh is, is that like a TV series? Back, yeah. He just gets in... A... That's it. Yeah. No, he just gets um, screen right present because it's like based on oh, the screenplay. Right. Is. Uh nothing's been announced yet. All right. Well, uh, if if that's all we have to say about um, spoilers, but yeah, I, th- I think that's I think that's it. We've already um, talked about the any final scene, thoughts uh, on the film. Uh, that's brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, some great sequences, great yeah. performances, and uh, it's really worth really worth a, a watch. It's not too long as well. I don't, I don't think. No, that's not too bad. Uh, one Absolutely hour fine. It's not not bad for a war yeah, film because a lot of them are like three hours and stuff. Aren't they? Um, but then again, that's I think a good example of how it caters to yeah, the modern definitely audience. Definitely, it's a war film made for a modern audience. Definitely, um, I think Thank that's you. a good place to leave it. Thank you, James, for coming on. And we'll be back with another episode sometime soon. Make sure to follow on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, and follow on Twitter at Best Picture underscore Pod. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.